Assalamu alaikum. The topic we're going to cover today is plant nutrition. So we've divided it into three sections, photosynthesis, leaf structure, and mineral nutrition. Photosynthesis is the process carried out by green parts of a plant and to produce their own food. Leaf structure basically includes the internal and external structures of a leaf. And mineral nutrition is about the mineral ions that the plant will absorb from the soil and why they are required. So firstly, photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is a process carried out by green parts of a plant containing chlorophyll. Algae and bacteria also perform photosynthesis, but some bacteria perform photosynthesis. What is chlorophyll? It's the green pigment present in the chloroplast of plant cell and that absorbs light energy and converts it into chemical energy, enabling a plant to photosynthesize. So over here you can see in this diagram, so with the help of solar energy or sunlight, only then can the plant photosynthesize. So over here, these are the green parts of our plant and these are the parts that are going to photosynthesize. So what's the equation? Carbon dioxide from the air, plus water from the soil. This process will be carried out in the presence of light energy and chlorophyll in the leaf to form C6H12O6 glucose plus six molecules of oxygen that are released into the atmosphere, the oxygen that we breathe in. Now, one thing is important to understand why life depends on photosynthesis. Firstly, for respiration, plants are those organisms that are producing oxygen for organisms such as animals or us to take in. And so that's very necessary for our survival. But apart from that, it's also a source of food for us. And if it's not a direct source of food for us, then it's an indirect source of food for us. For example, if horses or any other organism is having grass, so their survival is depending upon grass. But if a chicken is feeding on something produced by plants, for example, grain, so and we're feeding on the chicken or we're having its egg, so that means that our survival is directly dependent on the survival of plants. And the survival of plants is dependent on photosynthesis, which is why we can say that life mainly depends on photosynthesis to be carried out. Over here in this equation, you can see that there are only six molecules of water at the beginning. In reality, there are 12 molecules of water. And then the product side includes six molecules of water as well. But we don't write them down because they get cancelled out since there is no change in them. Now, in photosynthesis, we have two types of reactions, light reactions and dark reactions. So what is the light reaction? That is known as photolysis. Photo means light. So in photosynthesis, photo means light and synthesis means the formation of something. So photolysis, in photolysis, this reaction is taking place in light, that's why it's known as a light reaction. So the water molecule under light energy is going to be broken down to a hydrogen molecule and an oxygen molecule. That is known as photolysis. And the dark reaction, which is the glucose reaction, does not need light to take place in that carbon dioxide binds with the hydrogen molecule to form glucose. This is complete photosynthesis in two reactions. Firstly, water molecules in that the plant has absorbed from the soil light energy is going to use it to break it down into hydrogen and oxygen and that hydrogen is going to be used to form glucose so let's have a look at the equation behind we have carbon dioxide and hydrogen uh, uh, and water over here so what happens first solar energy breaks this water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen that hydrogen molecule binds with the carbon dioxide molecule and gives you glucose. And where does this oxygen come from? When this water molecule was bro broken down using uh, from solar energy into hydrogen and oxygen, this is that water molecule that is formed as a product. Then over here we can see that um, 
there are two structures labeled and we're going to study those structures later on but let's discuss the importance of these structures so firstly we understood that this is a light reaction on a light dependent stage and this is a dark reaction on the light independent stage and now what happens that the chlorophyll in this chloroplast is trapping light for the light reaction and for the dark reaction where is this carbon dioxide coming from? It's coming through the stoma. Stomas are opening in, in your lower epidermal layer through which gases can diffuse. So carbon dioxide is entering through the stoma and the dark reaction can take place this way. The plants will use stored glucose on cloudy days when sunlight is not available. Now let's have a look at the conditions that are essential for photosynthesis to take place. Firstly, we have sunlight. Now, why is sunlight essential? We just discussed that um, it's essential for the light reaction and that light energy is converted to chemical energy by the chlorophyll uh, and that is stored in glucose. Then next, we need carbon dioxide and water. These both are the raw materials as we saw in the equation. These are the raw materials for photosynthesis. And so they're going to help us form carbo the carbohydrate or, or glucose, specifically glucose. Then we need chlorophyll. Again, that will trap energy. It's a green pigment and it converts light energy to chemical energy that will help the plant manufacture glucose. And lastly, we have a suitable temperature because photosynthesis depends on the reaction of the enzymes that are present in the chloroplast. The chloroplast just doesn't just contain chlorophyll, it also contains enzymes. And these enzymes are going to work at their best when there is going to be the suitable temperature for them. Then how, how is that glucose or the carbohydrate that's produced by the plant used by the plant? Why do plants photosynthesize in the first place? So it is used immediately by plant cells for respiration to provide energy that is used in cellular activities. It is used for the formation of cellulose cell wall. Cellulose is a carbohydrate and cell wall is the wall bordering every plant cell. Then it is converted into sucrose for its transformation, uh, transportation to other organs. For example, the roots, the stems, etc. And phloem is going to transport it to all the other parts of the plant. We're going to discuss what phloem is. Then it is converted to starch for temporary storage and converted back into glucose during night time. And lastly, it is used to form amino acids, fats, and proteins, proteins for growth and repair and as a nitrogen source, source for the plant. Because plants require nitrogen, we're going to discuss that in mineral nutrition. And so uh, proteins are fulfilling the role of growth and repair and as a nitrogen source. And nitrate ions plus glucose will form amino acids. So that's why amino acids are also formed and fats are also there. Then let's discuss the limiting factors. In a photosynthesis, what is a limiting factor? A limiting factor is one that directly affects a process if their quantity is changed. So what are the limiting factors for photosynthesis? Light intensity, carbon dioxide concentration, and temperature. And these three are all external factors. They're not there in a plant. Either nothing is changed in the plant, but it's something is changed in the environment. So that's why it's known as a external factor. So here we have the graph for light intensity. So you can see we're increasing light intensity and how does it affect the rate of photosynthesis? As the light intensity increases, the rate of photosynthesis is increasing from A to B. And here the light intensity is the limiting factor from A to B. And beyond point B, then the rate of photosynthesis is remaining constant. It remains the same, even though light intensity is increasing, which shows that light intensity is no longer the limiting factor. But still, even after increasing the light intensity, 
if there is a change in the rate of photosynthesis it means that light intensity is not responsible for it so let's see what are the two other factors that can be responsible it could either be carbon dioxide or it could be temperature so here when you have 0.1% carbon dioxide and 0.1% carbon dioxide in the lower two graphs the percentage concentration of carbon dioxide is similar but they have different temperatures so one the one with the greater temperature will have a slight difference a slight increase in the rate of photosynthesis compared to the graph with less temperature but if you keep the temperature constant but you increase the carbon dioxide concentration the temperature is 15 degrees celsius 15 degrees celsius but the concentration is changed from 0.1% to 0.4% so what happens there is a huge difference in the uh, in the rate of photosynthesis and the rate of photosynthesis increases which means that the percentage of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has a huge effect on photosynthesis and if you increase the carbon dioxide concentration and increase the temperature you're going to have optimal rate of photosynthesis the best rate of photosynthesis on these conditions so here you can see when you have high rates of carbon dioxide but you increase the temperature there's a huge difference here the temperature was 15 and 25 15 and 25 again here but the percentage carbon dioxide is very low in these two graphs so there's a very slight change but here when the carbon dioxide percentation is high percentage is high and then you have a change in temperature then there's going to be a huge change in the rate of photosynthesis which just proves our theory about how carbon dioxide and temperature can affect the rate of photosynthesis and how the temperature plays a role in the working of enzymes then let's discuss the external structure of the leaf so here we have a leaf and let's see all its different uh, functions so over here you have petiole or and this petiole is also known as the leaf stalk and then after when the petiole continues into the leaf blade this thin whole section is known as the leaf blade or the lamina this whole region so when the petiole continues into the leaf blade it is called the midrib or the main vein and branching out from the midrib we have branching veins or netted veins and so this vein is simply labeled as a vein and then these branch even further and they're called small netted veins so let's have a look at their functions why do we have all of these different functions what is venation firstly venation is how the veins are present in a leaf so they can be present parallel over here you can see that these veins are parallel and the small netted veins are in a form of a network so there are two ways in which veins can be present and that is going to be known as venation of a leaf what is the main vein or the midrib do it carries vessels for transport phloem and xylem vessels and the petiole or the leaf stalk it is actually supporting the leaf and it grows at an angle towards sunlight so when it grows at an angle towards sunlight that plant can absorb maximum sunlight so if the petiole is going to grow at a 45 degree angle and and sunlight and the sun will uh, rise towards that direction so that will help the leaf to absorb maximum sunlight because it will be in the direction of sunlight then the lamina or the leaf blade how how has it adapted to help out the leaf in photosynthesis it's very thin so that light can be absorbed easily towards depth and it has a large surface area and is flat so that maximum amount of sunlight can be absorbed so basically the lamina or the leaf blade is helping in the absorption of sunlight it's thin it's flat and it has a large surface area then the veins are branching so that the products of photosynthesis can evenly reach every single part of the leaf and no part is left so the product will be uniformly spread now let's have a look at the internal structure of a leaf imagine that it's the very same leaf but we've 
cut it into half and now this seems like something very thick but actually it's seen under a microscope so it's very thin less than a millimeter less than half a millimeter it's that thin and but we've magnified it so that we can study it so this is the cross section of a leaf if we cut a leaf and then we have a look at it so over here you can see all the structures present here you have the waxy cuticle over here this is just a layer a waxy layer on the surface of the leaf if you ever touched a leaf you'll see that on the top part it's going to have a waxy shiny surface and then you have the upper epidermal layer then you have the palisade mesophyll this whole dark green layer indicating that there is a lot of chlorophyll here then you have the spongy mesophyll it's like a sponge because there are many air spaces in between and you have these vascular bundles xylem and phloem tubes you can see that these octagonal ones outside are xylem and these yellow ones are phloem and you have guard cells over here that open and close to form stoma so the space that will be created will be known as the stoma and over here on the top as well you can see the guard cells but there are very less guard cells on the top they're much more on the bottom again you have a lower epidermal layer and waxy cuticle below the waxy cuticle on top is more important and the lower epidermal layer on the bottom is more important so here we have a whole diagram as it can be seen and exactly under the microscope so firstly we have the waxy cuticle what does it do it's a transparent material and it helps to protect against diseases and germs and that first layer of cells these this epidermal layer it's covered by the cuticle so that is going to reduce water loss and then we have the epidermal layer they do not contain chloroplasts why so that the sunlight can penetrate easily through the through this layer and reach the palisade mesophyll layer if there would be chloroplasts in it so the chlorophyll will trap the light energy and they will it will not let it pass through so when there is no chlorophyll in the epidermal layer then it can easily pass through to the palisade layer the palisade layer is the main photosynthetic tissues and the layers and it has a very thin cell wall and these cells are upright and are arranged like a fence as you can see here and in the picture earlier then you have the spongy mesophyll layer so these are cells that are irregularly shaped as opposed to the palisade cells and uh, there are spongy spaces in between then you have in palisade and mesophyll layer we discussed that there is a very thin wall why so that oxygen can diffuse if you can see there are some very dark arrows drawn throughout and this is actually the water that is being diffused and so that can also easily diffuse when you have thin cell walls so after that you have xylem and phloem they are forming a connection from the root to the leaf you must have seen in any image of a plant from the root to a leaf the whole stem that's going and they're branching out as veins that are the xylem and phloem they're the transport vessels of the leaf and here you can see on the top we have xylem vessels and on the bottom we have phloem vessels and since water transports to xylem vessels the water absorbed by the root so it's coming out of the xylem vessels and it's diffusing or moving through osmosis into each of these cells and how is that happening through water linings that are on the outside of every single cell every cell has its water lining and which is why the water can diffuse or pass through osmosis easily throughout each cell and eventually it leaves through the stoma but over here what happens is that they leave as water vapors through the stoma because a uh, stoma is only for gaseous exchange so from here when the water is passed out it's going to pass out as vapors from the stoma so the upper epidermal layer is protecting all the inner cells the lower epidermal layer has the guard cells and stoma the guard cells can open and close to allow the entry of gases and water vapors to leave and the guard cells also contain chloroplasts 
Then we discuss that phloem and xylem. We discuss the job of xylem. What does phloem do? Phloem carries the products of photosynthesis produced by mainly by the palisade cells away from the leaf to other parts of the plant. And then the xylem, as we discussed, is transporting water and minerals from the root to the leaf. And specially magnesium is required for the xylem to bring it here. Why? Because magnesium is required to form chlorophyll and chlorophyll is required especially for these palisade cells, but also for these spongy cells and for the guard cells. And excess food, well, they've transported food, the glucose produced from uh, through phloem to other parts. But if there is excess food left over, then that is stored in the form of starch, but it's transported through phloem in the form of sucrose. So you should know that the stored form of glucose is starch and the transporting form of glucose is sucrose. Now let's talk a little bit about these guard cells and we're going to discuss them later on as well. These guard cells are light sensitive or potassium ion sensitive. And so when there are a lot of potassium ions in the guard cells, they're going to open up and form that space called stoma. And where there is a deficiency of light or a deficiency of potassium ions, they're going to close. And so there's going to be no opening. We discussed that water lining is surrounding all of the mesophyll cells. That's something very important and that is helping in diffusion. That is also called the moisture layer. So you need not get confused if you hear that term. Now let's talk about mineral nutrition. So what are the minerals that are required mainly by a plant? The plant is absorbing minerals in the form of ions through diffusion and active transport. So diffusion is going to take place to an extent, but when there is a lot of minerals inside the root hair and there is even less outside, so diffusion can't take place because ions will move from a region of higher concentration to lower concentration. So the root is going to use active transport to absorb the remaining minerals. And what are the minerals needed by the plant? Firstly, nitrogen. So nitrogen is um, absorbed as a nitrate ion. So what does this NPK stand for? NPK is, it, it's, it, it's a general term for a type of fertilizer, NPK fertilizers, which means nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. So that's what NPK stands for. And so in this, nitrogen is absorbed in the form of nitrate ions, and it is used to make proteins. Now, why are these proteins required? For enzymes, we discussed the role of enzyme activity. And so that they're very necessary for photosynthesis. And if a plant is deficient in nitrogen, if there is scarcity of nitrogen, if there is less nitrogen in the plant, what happens? There is stunted or poor growth of the plant. You can see how the growth of the scorn has become stunted and how poorly it's growing. It has a weak stem. It's pretty visible over here and a yellowish color. You can see how they're sort of yellow brown in color, how the leaves have turned yellow brown and the leaves start to die. That's also pretty visible over here. Some of them have died and also fallen on the ground. Then next we have phosphate ions. So that's absorbed as PO4, three minus, and it is used to make the DNA of the plant. And it is also important for energy releasing reactions. If your plant is deficient in phosphorus or phosphates, then what happens? You have poor root growth. Your roots will not spread out that well and that won't work as efficiently. The plant will start to turn dark green or purplish as you can see here. First it will turn dark green and then it will have that purplish dark magenta sort of color. And the leaves will have red coloration around the veins. If I magnify this image, then I will also find red coloration. And you can also see the midrib has turned red over here in these leaves. Next we have magnesium. And magnesium is absorbed in the form of magnesium ions. We discussed why magnesium is important for the synthesis of chlorophyll. And if your plant is deficient in magnesium, then what happens is that there is yellowing of the leaves, gradual yellowing of the, yellowing of the leaves. 
usually from the bottom and then to the top. So the uh, leaves at the bottom are first going to turn yellow and then the leaves at the top will be initially green and over time they are also going to turn yellow. As you can see here in this diagram, how that leaf, how different leaves from the plant are showing a deficiency in magnesium. These are not the same leaves. These are this the leaf on the rightmost side has been taken from the very bottom of the plant, and the leaf on the leftmost side has been taken from the very top of the plant. And it's dark green, but you can still see some patches of yellow in it, indicating it as there's deficiency of magnesium. And this condition, when it continues and your leaves have become have turned yellow that is known as chlorosis. So when your plant has chlorosis, you should know that there is a deficiency of magnesium. Because magnesium is specifically required for chlorophyll formation. When you're not having a chlorophyll formation, so your plant is not going to have green color anymore. And we know that these pigments, the chlorophyll is a pigment, so it's protein in nature. All pigments are protein in nature. And protein needs carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and sometimes sulfur to form. We have discussed that in the chapter of nutrition. Then potassium. It's absorbed in the form of potassium ions as K plus ions. And that's needed for the regulating of the guard cells so the opening and closing of the stoma by guard cells. And its deficiency will result in discolored or mottled leaves. You can see how the leaf is losing color and how it's becoming mottled, sort of brittle and droopy and flaccid. We've discussed all of that in the previous chapter. Now, an other type of elements are also required. Other types of mineral ions are also required. These are known as trace elements because they're required in minute quantities, which are, you can see at the bottom of the image, these are the trace elements. Mainly they are iron, manganese, and boron. As you can see over here, these green colored ions. And they're required for healthy growth of plants. There are various fertilizers used for supplying mineral ions if they are not there in the soil. We discussed an example such as NPK uh, fertilizers where the nitrogen source usually... Okay, now we're going to have a look at the regulation of stomatal opening, which is a hypothesis and that's known as the potassium ion pump. Here we're actually going to discuss how the stoma opens and closes and what helps the stoma to open and close. We know it's the guard cells. So this is not the way you're going to draw your stoma if it's asked in your exam. You're going to draw it like beans. And let me show you an image on how it should look like. Like this. Over here on the top, you can see this is an open stoma and you want to close it. You're just going to bridge the gap, but it should still have a it should still look like a bean-like structure. And so let's discuss how are the stoma opening and closing because it's not a phenomenon that just takes place. So when you have light, when there is a presence of sunlight, what happens is that these guard cells start to absorb potassium ions from other neighboring cells. The other neighboring cells start to give Potassium ions are the guard cells. What are these other neighboring cells? They are the lower epidermal cells because in the epidermal layer, in the lower epidermal layer, we have guard cells and epidermal cells. So the epidermal cells are going to give their potassium ions in the presence of sunlight to guard cells. That's some special feature that they contain. And when there are going to be a lot of potassium ions, what happens? What kind of a solution does it become? It becomes something concentrated where there are a lot of ions and less water. Then what happens is, and the water potential has been lowered in the guard cells due to increased concentration of potassium ions in the guard cells, they start absorbing more water because that's what happens when you have an That's what happens when you have a solution with more ions and less water. So after that, it's going to start absorbing more water and it's going to be pumped. Those guards are going to be pumped and due to that, the, they're going to move apart. They're going to have an opening that is known as the stoma. So the stoma will open. 
because there is the presence of water and potassium ion, so it's very full. But on the other hand, when you do not have sunlight, you, over here you can see that these potassium ions are moving in, but then now there are very few potassium ions outside the guard cells because the guard cell has taken in those potassium ions. But when, on the other hand, you do not have sunlight and it's nighttime, then these potassium ions are returned back to the neighboring cells, the epidermal cells, and when they do not have potassium ions in them, there is more water. And when there's more water, so that means that it's a diluted solution. And so it contains less ions and the same amount of water is going to start leaving water outside to other neighboring cells because it will have a higher water potential as compared to other epidermal cells. And as a result, it will lose water and the cells are going to close. Over here, you can see when the stoma was closed, so all the water molecules were outside. Not all, but uh, mainly all the molecules had moved outside because there were very little potassium ions inside. But when the stoma opens, so there is a lot of potassium ions as well as water inside your guard cells. That's the simple process of diffusion and osmosis. And we've studied that in another video. If you want to check that video out, you can go visit our channel. We have cell structure and organization and diffusion and osmosis both taught there. So you can go check those videos out and they're going to help you with this chapter. Thank you.